Uh, he is my brother, so I'll take him some credit or something. I don't know what he does again. Um, but he's awesome, and uh, he's actually going to be back this next week, back in town this next week, and so we're going to be able to have some time to, to hang out and spend together. Um, and, uh, and so that was an awesome message. I, I just, I was like, you know, sometimes, you know, as a pastor, you have an opportunity to be able to say some things, and then when you're a guest speaker, they can say other things. And I was just curious how many people would actually show up tonight after last week's message, but um, it was awesome. Look at you guys, you guys are amazing. <laughs> so, uh, so tonight, though, what we're going to do is we've been talking in prior weeks before Randy came. We were talking in Acts, and we've been going through Acts chapter 1, 2, and 3. And last week, uh, the week before Randy spoke, we had uh, Acts chapter 4. And by the way, if you want to go online, you can go on to Facebook. You can go on to uh, the Field Church group, and you can be able to see all the messages there that are live, that, that were live and are recorded there. So here's what I want you to do. If you've got your phone, you've got your tablet, you've got your whatever, I want you to break it out. Last week was awesome. We had 23 shares last week, so that was really cool. We had over 460 views last week. Um, so what that means is that just reaches out to more people. And that just really extends the hands of what's going on here and really begins to minister to outside of our own, our own realm. So if you have your phone, get online, go to Fuel Church page. When you get to the Field Church page, share it. It's going live right now, so you just feel free to share it. Also, take out your phone so you can be taking some notes as well. Um, and then, uh, and so last week, so the week before Randy came, we were talking about Acts chapter 4, and it was on Easy Peasy. You guys remember that? Easy Peasy, Lemon Squeezy. And uh, we were talking about how not everything in following Christ is actually easy. And sometimes that we need to fight, we need to actually push back and not just to lay down and kind of let everybody kind of track over us. And oftentimes we want to take this path of least resistance, right? In other words, if something didn't quite work out like I wanted it to work out, then we all said, no, that must not be God, right? But how do you know there's oftentimes we have to push through things, that's God. That there's times that we actually have to thrust ourselves through, because it says what? We fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness in the heavenlies. And so there's this peace that sometimes we just have to fight through. And sometimes it's just not easy, but it's actually difficult. And, uh, and, and just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's not God. And so we've got to remember some of those things. So as we continue our study this week in Acts, we're going to finish up Acts chapter 4. But what I want to do is I want to, again, kind of remind us real quick in regards to what happened in chapters 1, 2, and 3. So in chapters 1, 2, and 3, remember that the Bible is not just a storybook. It's actually history. You can go back to these places. I mean, I was on the steps in Jerusalem. I was in these places where, where the, where the 3,000 people got baptized. I mean, all this stuff is, is, is historical. It's not something that is, you know, sometimes we look at the Bible or we look at the things of Christianity. And it's almost like this story or a fairy tale or something of that nature. But that's not anything near what this is. This is actually history in the making. And so when we take a look at this, I just want us to really be ready to understand that let's not just read this thing, let's just don't study this stuff, let's don't just memorize it, but how about if we continue the story? Wouldn't that be awesome? How many would think that would be awesome, right? That, that the things that you're seeing happen in the Bible are actually happening in your everyday life. I think that would be pretty flippin' awesome. I mean, I'd be like, sweet, you know? When I was, you know, I tell the stories when I was in Ghana, I tell the stories when I'm in, in Africa, the stories when I'm in, in Central you know, completely healed of stuff. And, and then, not only that, but financially. It's like, what, financially, you know, you've been there, done that, about the teaching on the struggle piece, right? And then, watching God come in the midst and actually making ways along the way. Now, it's not necessarily easy, but God's making provision, and we're watching these people walk out these steps that they normally wouldn't have seen happen in their lives. So, I don't want, I just don't want to study it, I just don't want to read it, I don't want to memorize it, but I want this to be our story, and I want this to be, I want us to create some amazing history. I, I want to be a part of that. How many of you are with me? It's like, I, I, I want to be a part of that piece, where we're actually a part of this history. So let's remember what's happening in Acts. So, remember Acts chapter 1? You remember, uh, Jesus told them, what? Don't leave Jerusalem, right? Because the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. And then, and then in, in chapter 2, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes on them, just as he promised. And it talks about the tongues of fire that came upon each one that were in that room. There was about 120 in the room that night, or that, that morning. 
And all of a sudden, they begin to speak other languages. And, and when we talk about tongues of fire, we begin to decipher that and pull that whole thing apart. What that really mean? It's like, is, was this an odd experience? Was this just something that never, ever happened? No, this was something that actually did happen in the past. And the Old Testament talks about it. And we, re, we went through those things. And so we talked about tongues of fire being a known language, right? Remember, because all the disciples, they heard them speaking their language. And they're like, who are these people? Because all these people from coming from Jerusalem for Pentecost. And they heard their languages. They heard their, their, their languages being spoken by the disciples. And they're like, who are these people? What's going on here? And Peter gets, has this opportunity. He gets up and addresses the crowd. And after addressing the crowd, what happens? 3,000 people get saved right there. 3,000 said, man, I want to be a follower of Jesus. I, I want some of that after Peter spoke. And, and then they said, not only did, did they believe, but what? They were what? Baptized. And we talked about the importance of baptism, that there's this peace of baptism, and that, that's not just a, a symbolic thing, but it's actually a spiritual peace that actually takes place in our walk. Some of the stuff we don't understand, but we just do it by faith anyway. Then we go on and we see that, remember, Peter and John were walking up the temple steps, and as they're walking up the temple steps, there's a, there's a beggar guy there, and uh, the beggar was lame, couldn't walk, he's been that way for 40 years. Peter and John walk by him, and he's expecting what from Peter and John? He wants money. And Peter and John are like, man, right now I am dirt poor. But I have something that you won't even expect. I have something to give you that you won't. Listen, this is phenomenal. And Peter and John, what they do? They reach down their hand. Did they pray? Did Peter and John pray at that moment? No praying was going on. Peter and John, with tongues of fire, spoke it into this guy's life. If you remember, how was the earth created? How was the heaven and the earth back in Genesis? How'd that all happen? It was through the word. It was through speaking, right? So they spoke it, and they said, get up, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk, right? And they didn't just stand, stand back and say, get up and walk, did they? What'd they do? They reached out their hand, they grabbed a hold of him and said, get up and walk, and pulled him up as they were speaking. And what happened, man? The guy's all this ligaments, it, tissues, and, and all the muscles and the bone and all that kind of stuff. And the guy started walking. That's pretty cool, right? Don't you think that would be pretty cool to see happen? I mean, oh, I, the, 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 the guy that in, in Ghana that, with the knee thing, that he was healed. And, the other guy that, that we were praying for who was blind, he couldn't see, and, and, and all of a sudden he could, he could see. And, I mean, how many you know that that stuff will blow your brain away? You're like, oh, man, I just, this, is, this is just some awesome stuff, right? And so, <laughs> and what's interesting is, is that Peter takes advantage of this opportunity, and he stands on the temple steps. Why? Because everybody knew this guy. He's been sitting there for 40 years. He's been going there every day. People have been seeing him, pass by, and they pass by him. And because of the people that they are, they were generous people. They would give him, they would, they would, because the beggarship wasn't like it is today. And so they would, they would give him money and, and be glad to do so. So they knew this guy. What I love about this is God set this up in the beginning of time. Here's this guy, and he's, he's lame. And, and Jesus, we talked about that. Jesus probably walked by the same lame guy. But yet, why wasn't he healed? Then? I don't know. I don't get it, right? Except for now is the appointed time, and Peter and John came with the same power, with the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead was living in them and lives in us. And, and, and they were able to do that. And so... All of a sudden, Peter t takes advantage of this, and he stands up there, and he's preaching again, right? And he's, he talks, and then, lo and behold, there's always somebody that comes along, right? A bunch of buzzkills, we talked about that. People that are coming on, they were just, like, coming up, and they're, whoa, 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 you can't be doing this. Well, what, I can't be help, helping people out? You, you can't be doing this. You mean I can't be setting people free? You, you, you can't just do this. And you know what's so funny is in today's society, it's the same kickback that we get with, with Christianity when I walk into a school system. The same kickback I get when I walk into a secular system and they say, whoa, 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 separation church today. No, 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 no. We don't want you praying for people because they just might get healed. And we've got medicine for that. 
And we're gonna we're gonna do it. Now I'm not against medicine. I'm not I'm not one of those guys that is against medicine. What I'm saying is we have relied so much on all those things that we never give God an opportunity, do we? So I say do both. Trust God, take the meds, watch God work, get off your meds. How about that? And so I, I, I see this stuff, I, it's like, man, if I, if I try to help somebody, if I, if I, as an adult, walked into a high school tomorrow and started praying for some students in the high school tomorrow, you know what would happen to me? I'd be arrested, I'd be escorted out, all those other kinds of things. So it's no different, this, I'm just telling you, it's, it's the same scenario. We always say, well, that was a different time. Why, of course that stuff happened. And why, everybody gets healed. And da 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 and We always give these excuses because it was the time that it happened. And I'm telling you, nothing's different in today's society. And they were pressed up against the Sadducees, the priests, the temple guards. Remember we were talking about that? Temple guards were like the chief of police. It was a whole political realm that was going on. Talk about the Sadducees. They didn't even believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in demons. And here Peter standing on the top of the steps and saying, Jesus is risen! Boy, that just came against those guys. That man, shh. You can't talk about being risen because that just shuts down our political power. It shuts down our money. It shuts down our, our all of our operations. Don't talk about the resurrection. But it's historical. It's a fact. I mean, Jesus rose from the dead. And so it's like... And they're, they're saying it off their lips. Why? Because they saw it. They, they, they were with Jesus for 40 days after he rose from the dead. And they're just recounting history. This is just what happened. I, I saw this thing. So they brought Peter and John in. They arrested them. You guys remember that? At the, at the top part of chapter 4. And then it says that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember? He's not filled with himself, but he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And he begins to preach to these people. And he begins to say these things in front of these men, the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees, the, the temple guard, and the priests. And they were, shh, shh. And they told him, you cannot talk of this, ever. Now, the thing is, they didn't want to beat them or do some of those kind of things or kill them or any of that kind of stuff. Why? Because they were afraid there was going to be a riot outside, right? Because by this time, now it was 3,000 people, but 5,000 people. In the short period of time, all of a sudden, two more thousand people became followers of Jesus. I mean, that's pretty phenomenal, right? How many like to see some of that going on around here? And it says they, and they say, you can't do this. And, and Peter and John was like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't obey you. I know you're in charge of all this stuff, but I can't obey you because I, I, I can't stop talking about the very real experiences that I have with Jesus. You can tell me that they're not true. That doesn't mean they're not true. They're my experiences. I have them. I've experienced healing in my life. You can't take that away from me. You can tell me to shut up all you want, but that doesn't make it not real. Remember, you know what's going on right now, right, in the news today? Hillary Clinton came out and she was like, talking about all the fake news going on. And I'm like, all you politicians, stir fake news. Shut up. You know, it's like, right? So all the fake news went on. Well, that's exactly what they want to do. They want to spread fake news. This stuff doesn't really happen. This stuff doesn't really work. There was really no resurrection of the dead. And they're trying to, they want the fake news to continue. And Peter and John saying, I'm not going to go along with you in your fake news story. I'm going to speak life. And I'm going to speak truth. And I'm going to speak freedom. And I'm going to speak deliverance. Why? Because I've seen it happen in my life. <coughs> I've watched it myself. And why wouldn't you want to help people? Well, because now they're no longer under my control. Or I can't control them anymore. I can't manipulate them anymore. I can't. Right? I mean, that, that's the reality. So turn with me to Acts chapter 4. We're going to finish up tonight. Acts chapter 4. So we're going to start with verse 23. Question I have for you tonight. Do you guys remember a time that you knew that you knew that you knew that you were right? Anybody? Husbands and wives? <laughs> Speaking to you right now. Excuse me. Yeah, I felt really good every once in a while when I really do get it right. <laughs> and, and, and Maria, Maria has to say, okay, you're right. Like, that is the most amazing feeling in the world, right? Um, or how about some of your kids with your parents, right? It's like, man, dad is such a squirrel. I mean, I know that's my kids' thing. And so it's kind of like, it's like, and, then, and, and they are right on a topic or a subject, right? And dad's not right. And how good does that feel? Does that feel like amazing, right? 
Right? And he was like, whoo, yeah, I got that one down, right? It's, it's such an awesome feeling. Well, tonight we're going to talk about that piece of confidence. And the, the title of tonight's message is called Fully Convinced. So let's, let's, we're going to walk through this verse by verse. We're going to start with uh, chapter 4, Acts chapter 4, start with verse 23. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and the elders had said. Verse 24, when they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O sovereign God, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. You spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through, your, through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and, the, and, and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in this very city. For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything that happened was determined beforehand according to your will. So, go back up to verse 24, it says, it says, it says well, 23, so as soon as they, they were free, Peter and John returned, and they came to the other believers, and what was their first reaction when they got together with all the believers? <coughs> in, verse, in verse 24, when they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voice together, they prayed. And what did they pray? This is pretty powerful, guys. If you guys can pick some, some of the stuff out, it's like, this is pretty powerful. What did they pray? They prayed Psalm chapter 2, is what they prayed. They prayed the scriptures. Is what they pray. I want to encourage you in your time of prayer. I want to encourage you to pull out the scriptures, pull out the songs, pull out the prophets. Those are the easiest ones to deal with. Pull them out and begin to pray the scriptures over your life and over your family. There's something powerful about praying the scriptures. Why? Because the word of God is what? God breathed. So you know you're not messing up, right? Your prayer? <laughs> Anybody ever felt like you messed up in your prayer? Okay, so, so you know you're not messing up your prayers. It, it, it's God breathed, so therefore it's his word, so therefore I'm just repeating what he said, that he has promised me or that, that should be a part of my life and, or that should be taking place in my life. And so I encourage you, take the scriptures. It's a very, very powerful way to pray. And I find it interesting because what they quoted was the Old Testament scriptures, and the Old Testament scriptures, we talked about this in the past, Old, New Testament compri is comprised of about 50% of Old Testament scriptures. So all the people that are out there going, well, I'm just a New Testament believer. No, you're not. 50% of the New Testament, if it, literally, if I took out everything that was Old Testament scriptures from the New Testament, you'd have half of a New Testament. And it would sound really funny as you read it. It's ridiculous to think that there's an Old Testament scripture, Old Testament way of life, and a New Testament way of life. It's the Testament. It's God's promises to his people. Different things happen in different periods of time along the way, but, but it's just the testament. It's just his promise to his people. So this particular passage that he read was Psalms chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. You can turn there if you'd like. You can see it for yourself. But I love what, why they did this. Why? Because it was reminding themselves that all of this has already been talked about way in advance. David already mentioned what was going to happen here today. I mean, that's pretty powerful. And so it kind of was a comfort piece to them. This stuff was already talked about. And, and people were, it was already talked about that people were going to come against Jesus and his followers. Not only just people, but whole nations were going to come against Jesus and his followers. You know, the verse said there, it said in, in Psalm chapter 2, it said, why were the nations so angry? I mean, we're just doing good. We're just pointing the way to freedom. Why are these nations so angry? Tell me, why does Saudi Arabia get so angry when a Christian believer wants to stand on a street corner and preach the good news of Jesus? Why do they think that they can just throw people in jail or or do the tortures or whatever that they want to do. Why do they get so why do they get so angry with, with pastor with our pastors in India, with Pastor Anand and Vijaya? Pastor Anand just deciding to his buddies were at a prayer meeting. Just twelve of them 
in nations of millions, multi-millions, and 12 of them are praying. Why do you suppose that they're so angry that 12 people in a private room are praying? They weren't even on the street corners. Because it goes against the very spirit of which those places exist. Because you fight not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of darkness. It, it's, the, it's those very reasonings that that stuff happens. And, and so when, when you walk into the middle of a situation and someone gets angry with you about, you're trying to point them to freedom, and, ang and they get angry about it, why is that? It's not them, because we can't fight not against flesh and blood, right? It's not them, it's, it, it, it's that thing that starts to stir up inside. Why? Because that thing wants to control that person. And what's the Spirit of God do? What's the Holy Spirit want? He wants you to walk in freedom. He wants you to walk in His love. He wants you to walk in His grace and in His mercy. He doesn't want to control you. But if you take a look at Islam, man, it is the most controlling religion in the world. I mean, seriously. Now, people tell me, all of you, right, there's good Muslims, bad Muslims, all that kind of stuff, radical Muslims, all that. Listen. Islam, in and of itself, the way it works, the way it reads, is very controlling. And, and again, it's coming after a guy, right, lifting up a prophet named Muhammad, who said is greater than Jesus. And the reality is Muhammad is what? Dead. Jesus and his followers and many people saw Jesus what? After he was died, buried in the ground, crucified, what did they see Jesus? He was alive. I mean, he was around hundreds of people. You can't make that up. So I would call an alive prophet greater than a dead prophet. Just saying. That's who I want to go for. I want to go for the guy that defeated hell and the grave. Not the guy who's still there. Right? If you're an alcoholic, do you want another alcoholic helping you? Heck no. You want somebody who got sober who can help you, right? You want somebody who's walking in the new life to, to, to get you there, right? Jesus, he's the new life. He'll get you there. So here's all the stuff that's taking place, and they're reminded that the plans were futile. In other words, we win. His grace is sufficient. How much more fun is it that you know that you can't lose? I mean, if you were going to do something fun, right, right, and you knew you couldn't lose, what would you be doing during that time? What would you be doing during that game? You'd be doing all sorts of crazy, right? Come on. Because what? It's so much more fun, right? If I knew, if I knew that I was going to win, what do I have to lose? I, I win. Right? And, and, and that's what they're repeating themselves. It's like, why? Why, were, why are they doing these things? It's so futile. The plans are futile. Why are they doing this? I mean, even as we celebrate Christmas this season with friends and families, I mean, here's the reality. Jesus came to this earth, and we and we we talk about Christmas, and it's, it becomes this. We have so commercialized Christmas, it's just pathetic, and we forget why we do what we do, and then then we then we then we, then we, then we oh, yeah, take it off the freaking screen. Um, and, and 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 even even uh, Jesus, when he came to this earth, even his birth of Jesus was controversial. I mean, think about it. This little baby, little baby Jesus, you know, you know, you know, you know, you don't want to see it, but little baby Jesus, lying in the manger. Uh, some people pray to little baby Jesus. Um, anyway, so so little baby Jesus, right? We get this whole thing, and it's all like cutesy and all that kind of stuff. But here's the reality: there was a war going around around the birth of Jesus. 
You guys remember that? Herod, right? Herod was just trying to get rid of this kid even before he even came to the earth. If he could have, he would have done an abortion. Because he knew that somebody was talking about a king that was getting ready to come into power and he didn't want it to, right? His pride, his you know, glory, his control, his, right? And he didn't want that to come down on him. And so he didn't want somebody to be greater than him. And so what did he do? He went out to search. So the angel came. I mean, God bless Joseph and Mary, right? I mean, Joseph doesn't get enough credit. That dude had to listen to an angel. Get up, move your family from Israel, and go to Egypt. That's not an easy road. That's not, a, that's not like getting on an airplane and I'm going from Israel to Egypt. It's not like going, I'm going to get on an airplane and go from here to New Jersey. It's not that easy. And they had to travel through all the stuff and all the things that they had to go through and travel and go down to Egypt and hang out in this foreign land. I don't know about you, but living in a foreign land isn't as easy as you think it is, right? Language is different. The food is different. How they do what they do culturally is different. There's a lot of things that you have to adapt to. It's not simple and easy. Some of us have a difficult time through moving from across, you know what I'm saying, across the city. That was so tough. That was so difficult. Right? Where, where is they, they had to go to Egypt. So, and then they had to wait for him to get to a certain point until Herod died off, and then they were saying, then angel's like, okay, all clear. You can come back into your homeland. And they did. And what did Herod do? He was killing off all the newborn babes, sons, two years and younger. It was born in controversy. It wasn't born in easy peasy. It was, it was born out of war. It, it was a war. That, that was going on here. And so, even today, I still think they're still trying to kill Jesus, right? And they're trying to take him out of all history. I mean, with that stupid thing that was up there before that said, Happy Holidays. And then it said, Stress me bad and crazy, man. I go around the place with people, Happy Holidays. And I'm like, Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> he loves you. No, just kidding. <laughs> but everything's been so commercialized with Christmas. And, and we're pushing him out, pushing him out. Why? Because I can redo history. If I can get them out of my books, if I can get them out of my stuff, if I can get them out of, right? That's what Hitler's plan, right? Was It's like, if I can just get rid of all the history books, if I can get rid of all the literature, if I can get rid of all, I can recreate history as I see it. But that's exactly what we're doing in our school systems and our college campuses. We're trying to recreate history. And I don't get it. I don't understand it because, you know, at every turn they're trying to kill Jesus still today, right? I mean, if I was in a Muslim it would kind of be kind of weird. But if I was in a Muslim headdress, that would be kind of weird. <laughs> but, okay, if, if, but you know what I'm saying? And I walked into a campus, I would be given more rights than if I walked in as a Christian on a campus. And, and those are the things that we've got to look at. We've got to sit there and go, why is that? That doesn't make any sense, right? Because this is what Jesus is saying. He says, man, I want to give you freedom. I want to give you peace. I want to give you hope. I want to give you joy. I, I, I want to embrace you. I want to see you become fully alive. I want to, I want to see the gifts and the talents I've planted in your life. And I want to see them blossom and bloom. I want to give you opportunities you have never seen before. That, that's Jesus. But as a follower, often, often these things, offering these things to others, <coughs> there's a big price to pay. And here's the deal. We can't do it on our own strength or even on our own initiative. Let's go to verse 29. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats. Give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Notice here what their response was, what their prayer was. O oh Lord, number one, what? Hear their threats. God, God, I just want you to hear the threats that are going on around our society. I want you to hear the threats that are on our college campuses and our school systems and at my job. I mean, it's not even anymore in the school system, man. I mean, many of you are working jobs that you feel like you can't even mention the name Jesus or otherwise you're going to get crucified. And then what do they say? 
So they just got told, remember this, they just got told, do not, do not speak of Jesus. They come back, give the word to the people. They told us not to speak of Jesus, but we told them that there's nothing else we can do because of everything that he's done in our lives. And their response is, O oh Lord, hear their threats and, and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. I'm going to camp on this just for, here for a few minutes. Notice what the response, hear their threats, and then next they say, give us great boldness. This word boldness is, is in the Greek, is parisia, and it means confidence or with freedom. So give us great boldness or give us with great freedom. Let us talk of you, right? Openness, bold resolve. When said it, uh, when, when it's said, you can say, say that it was definitely remembered, right? When something was spoken, and when you speak with great boldness, it's something that is remembered. It captures your heart. Or, or I love this one. This is the one that, that I titled the message off of tonight was this. That word great boldness was fully convinced. There was zero doubt. When you know you're right, and you know that you know that you know that you're right, and nothing will sway you from where you're at. Now, there's something great about that, right? Because it's what, when you know that you know that you know that you know that you're right, people can come at you with all sorts of stuff, and you're like, it don't matter because I'm right, right? And you're, and you're confident in that. And you've got this amazing boldness when you know that you know that you're right. And at the same time, it, it's fun to, be, to know that you know that you know that you're right. Because there's so much you can do with that. You, you can walk into areas and territories and, and put your shoulders back and be proud and be confident and go, man, it, it's okay. It doesn't really matter. You can say whatever you want to say. You can put whatever fake news out there you want to put out there. But that doesn't make it true. And all of a sudden, you, you have your shoulders back and you're, yeah, you know. When you know that you know that you know that you're right. You can say whatever you want against me. So, and what I love about this is when you're fully convinced, you know, you are so convinced that you know you got this thing and that you can do it. Anybody ever been in that situation where you're like, man, I got this. I know this one. Anybody ever been in, like, you guys done, like, Trivial Pursuit or something of that nature, right, where you won these games, right, and someone asks a question, you're like, oh, whew. right? Anybody ever been there? And you're like, man, I can't wait to parade this one. <laughs> so... So here's the deal. So I'm going to show you a video clip. Hopefully this one works. Hopefully this will be guys know. Sometimes technology is awesome, and sometimes it's very frustrating. We have amazing people working it. It's just sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, so here's the deal. So I'm going to have you watch this video clip because this is somebody who was fully convinced. Take a look.
right? I think sometimes in our Christian walk is kind of like that, where we got to be fully convinced that we know that we know that we know. Sometimes there's a lot of treachery, there's a lot of stuff that comes on, there's a lot of battle zones that we got to go through, but the reality is if we will listen to the Spirit of God, we can get through all of it. And if we realize that the prize on the other side is worth it, then we'll do whatever it takes to get there, won't we? And I think that's what we need to be fully convinced of, that the prize on the other side is really worth it. I think sometimes we don't think the prize on the other side is all that worth it. And I want to get to a place in my own walk, and I want to encourage us all together to come to a place in our walks where it's worth it. The prize on the other side is worth it. <coughs> the prize of salvation, the prize of having a king who loves me and who, who's applauding me and encouraged me in the process. All those kind of things. I, I want that in my own life. That I know that I know that I know that I'm fully convinced. Because when I'm fully convinced, I can do anything. How about you? When I'm fully convinced, if you're timid about something, how many you know you goof up a lot when you feel pretty timid about something, right? You're nervous, you're kind of fidgety, you're, you know, I don't, and you, and you mess up. But when I'm fully convinced about it, man, I know this, I got this. Not because necessarily I got it, but because the Holy Spirit, for the same Spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in me, that same Spirit will guide me through this, I got this. Amen. Guys, I want to let you know tonight, you got this. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, if you say yes to Jesus, man, he is in and through you, and he wants to walk through you, speak through you. He wants the tongues of fire to come off of your lips where you're speaking the prophetic things, you're speaking the life-giving things. You're, you're the one reaching down, raising people up. You're the one being able to walk into the middle of the situation and peace comes. You're able to walk through life and favors upon your life. I'm telling you, when the spirit of God is on your life, you can do anything that he wants you to do. If he is leading you, guiding you, directing you in a certain path, guess what? It may not be easy. There may be obstacles, but the reality is you win, you get to the other side, and you are victorious. God has a plan and a purpose for each and every person who is in this room tonight, who's listening through Facebook. You, I'm telling you that God has a plan and a purpose and a vision for your life. It's by no mistake. God has raised you up for such a time as this, not just to kind of sit around and just kind of let life go by you, but rather get engaged in this thing that we call Christianity. Christianity is not, it's not a religion. I know sometimes it's kind of cliche. There's this, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Well, but it's true, it's a relationship. And it's, it's not something that I do on Sundays, and it's not something that I do on a certain day of the week. No, man, this stuff we live out 24-7. This is just who we are. And so when we walk this stuff out, when we, when we begin to go down this, this road and we begin to go these directions, we begin to say, yes, Jesus, I, I make you Lord of my life. That's not just saying I make you Lord of part of my life. It's saying, man, I make you Lord of my whole life. However, whatever that you desire to do. So I want us to be fully convinced, fully, and the, the scripture says what? Fully convinced for what? Fully convinced in preaching, it says. Now, this is where it freaks everybody out in the room. Because the languages that are used, we never go back to search this stuff out to see what they're really talking about here. So we make these huge assumptions, and what is preaching? Preaching is what I do, it's not what you do, right? That's what, we, that's what people say, man, I don't do no preaching, man. I do, man, that's what you do, it's not what I do. I do something completely different, I keep my mouth shut, I don't preach, right? But, but let's look at what the word is, what, what's that word mean? To preach. To preach about what? To preach about the word. So the word to preach, what's that mean? It means to speak. How many of you here in the room speak? Some of you are liars. <laughs> man, this is a setup, man. I know this one. This was a setup. Yeah. It just means simply to speak. In your going, speak. Have we talked about that, right? The Great Commission, 
go into all the world. Well, that's not for me. No, no, no. It's in your going. When you go, where you go. In your grocery shopping. <laughs> in your work, in your school, in your going. Speak. What am I supposed to speak out about? Speak the word. Well, what's that really mean? It means this. It means to speak that word. The word is logos. Speak logos. What do you mean speak logos? Speak the word. What do you mean speak the word? What's John 1, 1 say? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. So what am I supposed to speak about? What's the word? Huh? God. Okay. How do I do that? Well, you know how you do that? Speaking is done in several ways. Speaking is done in action. Speaking is done verbally. Speaking is done so many ways. But here's the reality. If you will love and value people, like we do here at Fuel Church, if you will love and value people, and you will listen to their story, I'm telling you, you'll be speaking the word. You'll be talking about God. Can you guys just do that? Can, can we just love people? You guys do a great job around here. I mean, you guys are doing it. We just love people. We just value people. And, and we speak life into them. How many think that's speaking the word of God? So sometimes we overcomplicate these things and we try to put things in these little nooks and crannies and packages and say, well, that's that person's job and that's that person's job and that's that. Man, no, it's not. It's, it's our job as a believer. It's our job as a follower of Jesus. It's our job. Sometimes I think about what would my response be if I was thrown in jail, beaten, and ridiculed. But think about it. Many of us are in our jobs, in our schools, in our families, in our friends. We get ridiculed. People make fun of us. People, are you serious? You believe that? You know? I have a, have a run at my job. I have a, I'm around some people that have some pretty uh, uh, colorful language, and, uh, and I just laugh my head off. Um, the other day I was making fun of one of them. That's what I did. And uh, he was talking about how... <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about how uh, people have a... Uh, how some, somebody, this guy, and he was talking about and he's, you know, somebody else, and he says, yeah, they had a, a Essen heart condition or something like that. And I'm like, what? How does that even make sense? I, and I, I said it out loud, actually. I, I, I said, how does that even make sense? So, so she has a poopy heart? <laughs> Help me understand that. Is her, is her heart full of poop? What, what's going on here? And he's like, well, you know what I mean. You know, it's, it's awesome. And so we have a lot of fun with it. And the other guy goes, man, he's going to be preaching about that on Sunday. I said, you bet I am. So, <laughs> so we have an opportunity right now in the middle of this Christmas season to stand up with great boldness or with being fully convinced. We're right. We're right. Guys, guys, we're right. Don't, don't let anybody convince you otherwise. We're, we're, we're right on this thing. It's, it, history, it backs us. We're, we're right on this thing. And uh, so this this year, let's offer some real Christ mischeer to people. Let's give them what the Let's give them some Christmas. Let's give them some more Christ, right? Christmas. That's uh, it's more Christ. Let's just give them more Christ. And in the middle of what we do for family and friends, right? When you're gathered around and talking about stuff, let, let's interject more Christ in the middle of the conversation. How about if we do that? Just speak a little bit more God in the middle of the conversation. Or this week we can have an opportunity to be at UCCS campus, and we're going to be up there, and we're going to be hanging out. We're just going to be loving on people, man. We're not throwing anything at them. We're not shoving anything down anybody's throat. We're going to be loving on people. It's a rough week, right? Finals week. How many know that's, those are rough times? How many know right now, during finals week, there are more suicides that end up happening during finals week than, 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 than most other times? And so here's the reality. It's like, how, how about if we go out there and, and, and put some more Christmas out there? How about if we just love on some more people and just say, hey, man, there's freedom, there's hope. You don't have to. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to, right? How about, how about how about if we do that? Or you know, when we when we 
take a kid off the tree over there, guess what we're doing? We're spreading more Christmas. We're spreading more Christ, right? To a Hindu or Muslim family in India. Go take, go, just go take one off the tree, man. And, and, and 25 bucks, right? Is that what it is? 25 bucks? 25 bucks and we're sponsor a kid for Christmas and they get a, a thing about Christmas that they'll be able to, in their language, to be able to take home to mom and dad. I would think, how cool is that? Hey, let's spread a little more Christ, right? In the middle of what we're doing. So in our everyday, in our 24-7, <laughs> in our going, let's let's do this stuff. Let's, let's and they, they went on to verse 30, and I'm almost done here. On verse 30, it said, stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of our, your holy servant, Jesus. So they continue to say, God, let us heal. Let's heal people. Let's see the miraculous take place. Let's, let's have some signs and wonders going on. So I want to encourage you tonight. Have your expectation level up a little bit, will you? How many know sometimes that we don't have our expectation up enough? I just don't know if this is going to happen. That's okay. Go ahead and do it anyway. Right? The lame guy. Right? You remember him? 40 years. Lame. You know, he was expecting money. He wasn't expecting a healing. He didn't have any faith. Isn't that good to know? To realize that God can work through that situation with where there seemed to be no faith on the one side? My point is this. Just get out there and start loving on people, praying for people. You know, when people say something to me about something, it's like, there's no questions. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to pray for you. And I just pray. Right? If it offends them, it offends them. If they get healed, they won't be offended anymore. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. It's just love on people, man. Man, I'm just trying to see you set free. This should not be an offense to you that I'm praying for you. I just want you to be free. I just want you to know that there's a God out there who loves you and he thinks you're pretty incredible. And that he thinks that you, he, you're pretty stinking awesome and, you, and you've got some, you got some future ahead of you. That's all I'm trying to say when I pray for you. So stretch out our hands with healing power. That the miraculous signs and wonders would happen, not by us, but by the name of Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they preached the word of God with boldness. There was yet another shaking. Well, why was that? Why, why was that necessary? Well, because man, when you when you give out, you need to get filled back up. When, when, when you, you know, you, you need to have an account. So when you give out, just, just feel free. Give out. Yeah. But, but realize, man, God, I, I need you. I, I need you to fill me. I, I, I want you to, I, I need to be filled back up again. <coughs> so all the believers were united in heart and mind. And they felt that what they owned was not their own, in verse 32. So they shared everything they had. Now this is not communism, just so you know, socialism, communism, that's not what this is. What this is, is that someone had an unction. Man, I just got to give it. So like in Israel, had an opportunity, Marina had an opportunity to visit a kibbutz. And a kibbutz does this. It's people, they all get together, nobody owns anything. They all share everything, but they're all, they can leave the kibbutz whenever they want to. They don't have to stay in the kibbutz. So it's all voluntary, <coughs> voluntary, you know, kind of thing. They protect each other. The kibbutzes protect one another. They protect from outside forces coming in. They're armed most of the time. And so the kibbutzes are kind of a cool community, kind of a communal kind of feel. But it was just, it wasn't done out of, it wasn't a cult, and it, and it wasn't and it wasn't socialism, and it wasn't communism. Why? Because socialism and communism demanded of you, right? What, what did we hear over the, over these last few, several years? Everybody wants to take the wealth and share it, right? That's against my will, right? That's different. When 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 it's when it, I freely give that, that's different. When we come into this place and we see a need here, which happens often. And there's a need here, and what happens often is people often step up to the plate freely, giving of their services, time, money, whatever it might be, in order to see it happen. Last night, there was a wedding here, and um, it was pretty awesome, it was a great time, but it was really cool because somebody volunteered out of the goodness of their heart from this church to supply the food and catering for the whole wedding because they saw a need. They weren't, it wasn't out of compulsion that they did that. But they did that freely out of their own heart. 
And, and that's the way we ought to operate, right? right? Because because what the disciples realized, we don't own nothing. It's not really ours in the first place. It's all God's. So here's, here's the thing that ends up happening is, is we need to start realizing how is this decision-making processes that we make in our life. Because oftentimes we make a decision-making process in our life. Why? Because it's, it, it benefits me. But we need to ask ourselves the question, how does this benefit the kingdom when we make a decision? Right? Because that's a life fully convinced. God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That, that's fully convinced, right? And so when I make these decisions about what I do with my money, time, finance, whatever I do, right? It, it's fully convinced. It's like, God, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? And that's how you do it. And you live a life of faith that way. How many know that there is amazing provision when we live a life of faith that way? And it's, and, and it's so cool, the, the miracles that begin to start happening around you because you're walking out this thing of faith. And that's what I love about this place. It's because people are, are willing to do that. Stand your feet. So this week, again, I want you to, as we're, we're going to get around these discussion groups here, we're going to talk here for a few minutes about what God has been sharing with us. The, the thing that kind of rolls up inside you, the thing that kind of maybe kind of made you sit up and go, hmm, that's interesting, or man, I need to do that, or that, that'd be awesome, or whatever it might be. And we're going to talk about that here in just a minute, but there's four things that I want you to, I, I want to kind of have you do this week, and that is this. Number one is I want you to listen. Be a good listener. Ask God, God, what do you want, right? What do you want me to do? What are you saying? How can I do it? How can I do it better, right? And to be alert of your surroundings around you, right? Live life with intention, right? Not just get, get up and live life by mistake, but live life with intention. I'm getting up this morning, God. This is your day. How do you want me to live? What does that look like? <laughs> How many think that would be pretty amazing, right, to do that? And then have an expectant heart on top of that going, I'm expecting to see something today. And watch what begins to start happening. This thing will just start rolling as you begin to explain. So be a good listener. And then number two. So number one is what? Listen. Number two, speak. Speak the truth. Not your truth, but speak the truth. Don't try to fix people, but ask questions about people around you. Love and value them. Listen to their story. Speak. Number three, act. Man, pray for people. Lay hands on people. Connect with people. Give to people. Whatever is necessary, do what God is asking you to do. Act on that thing that God is asking you to do. And again, do it with great expectation. Lastly, transformation. Be a part of it. Let the Spirit of God work through you. Be filled to the full to allow God to work through you to see transformed lives around you as well as your life being transformed. <clears throat> Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus and we thank you for tonight. God, we thank you for what you're doing in and through this place. And I, God, this is so awesome. For you are good, you are kind. There is nothing like you in the heavens and the earth. And we are so jazzed, excited to be a part of your process, your plan. And so tonight, in the name of Jesus, God, I just ask that you will just quicken our hearts, that you will speak in us, that you will speak through us, and that God, that, that this discussion groups that we're getting ready to have, that God, you would move through them and that you would utilize them for your purposes. And that God, that you would just stir in our hearts that this week we would step out just a little bit more, step out just a little bit more love and value people, hear people's stories and they tell them about our experiences with you. So God, take this time and use it for your name's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and get around your tables. We got uh, discussion group leaders will be there. We're just going to take a few minutes here to be able to talk about this topic that we talked about tonight. And um,